Bonjour. Bonjour. And bienvenue to our fourth lecture of our Château de la Loire and Ile-de-France series. My name is Patricia Bona. I'm the president of the board of director of Alliance Française Miami Metro. And I'm delighted to welcome our two special guests, Yannick Mercoiral, who will open for us today the doors of the Château Royal de Chambord. And welcome also to our series curator, Russell Kelly. First of all, a little bit of tedious housekeeping for those who are not acquainted to Zoom. You can choose a show video if you want us to see you riveted to your screen and listening attentively, but you can also stop video if you choose not to. Sound, you have all been muted, not because we don't want to hear you, but just because we don't want peripheral noises. Uh, you can use the chat box at the bottom of your screen if you want to ask any question or communicate. In fact, you could try that just right now and show us exactly where you're listening from. If you have trouble finding those icons, just move your cursor to the bottom of your screen where it's black and you will see those little icons appearing. Remember, chat all of your questions and they will be answered at the end of the talk. This series would not have been possible without our lead partner, the Alliance Française de Chicago. Bonjour to Aimé and to her team. We also welcome our friends from all the IF from the US network from the Fédération, the French heritage who I think know one or two things about the Chateau and for the participants and our friend from Weiss in Paris. Bonsoir Paris. Russell Kelly is the vice president of the FMM or Alliance Française Miami Metro, I should say, board in Miami. And he has curated this wonderful series of Chateau for us. He's the author of The Making of Paris, the story of how Paris evolved from a fishing village into the world's most beautiful city. We had the privilege last year to hear this as a conference, but this will soon be published as a book in March 2021. He has lived in France for nearly 30 years, and he has surely visited every single chateau that is featured in our series and many times. So now take it away, Russell. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Yannick Mercorel, who has been the Director of Heritage and of Cultural Programs at the Chateau de Chambord for the past 11 years. But those of you uh, listening from Chicago may have met him when he was the cultural attache attached to the general council let uh, in Chicago between 2002 and 2006. And while the previous two lectures about the Chateau of Amboise and Bois told the stories of Chateau that evolved over centuries with many different construction projects over centuries undertaken by counts and kings, the Chateau de Chambord was mainly built during the lifetime of a single monarch the great Francois Premier, Francis I, Renaissance man and builder. And Yannick in his presentation, which will be in English, will tell us and explain about the many influences that converged to form this unique chateau, which is, as he entitles his uh, presentation, an ideal castle. But before his presentation, Yannick invites us to watch a one minute video that shows the scale and symmetry of the Chateau de Chambord that distinguish it from all the other chateaux in the Loire Valley.
À vous, Yannick. Merci beaucoup, Russell. Um, thank you very much to the Alliance Française, and uh, I'm um, sort of very excited today to uh, to speak uh, uh, here in Paris because I am in Paris. Um, what you see here is my uh, private library. It's not the one from uh, Chateau de Chambord, uh, because as you know, probably the the chateau is closed for the moment. Um, actually, all the uh, the, the cultural institutions, uh, museums and monuments are closed in France because of the, of the COVID. Um, and uh, a, special, uh, a special bonsoir to Chicago because uh, this city uh, stays in my, in my heart. Because as you mentioned, I, I spent four wonderful years, like um, 15 years ago. So um, what I will um, try to, uh, to show you tonight is um, not exactly a sort of, uh, adventure or journey throughout the, the centuries, but, um, and all the different uh, people who, uh, who uh, lived in Chambord. Uh, but I will try to, to concentrate, to focus on, the, um, on the, the concept of the architecture and uh, mainly on uh, what makes uh, Chambord so unique. That is the, um, the, uh, the ideal castle that was probably in the in the mind uh, of uh, Francis the first and some others and uh, where does uh, this uh, come from so I will try to uh, yeah give you okay so um, what is um, what you have seen on the little film, on the little video, uh, is uh, this chateau, uh, as you will uh, hopefully be able to experience it in the in the few uh, coming years after the the, the pandemic. Uh, but this chateau is not uh, the chateau which was originally planned by uh, Francis the um, First. Actually. Um, if I come back to this map, uh, to this plan of the chateau uh, dating from the 16th century, um, the, the central part here, uh, the keep, uh, as we call it, uh, is, very, um, is very singular, very strange to a certain way. Um, as you see, it's um, built through a, a combination of squares, or rectangles and uh, and circles, uh, and in the center you have the the big the marvelous uh, double staircase of Chambord, and uh, this uh, staircase is right in the middle of a Greek cross that you see very clearly in the in the center of this uh, of this plan, and what is um, quite amazing uh, on this. Uh, on this plan of Chambord is that every floor is exactly the same. That is here, you have the first floor, but I could show you the first or the second floor, or even the, 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 the rooftop, the terrace, and you would see exactly the same uh, combination. And that is um, what is remarkable. You have here a sort of a, a model of um, the chateau uh, around uh, 1547, that is at the, at the death of uh, Francis I. Um, it's exactly what uh, François Ier had in mind when he began to think about this chateau, which is actually his first uh, construction from scratch. Uh, because as you um, you happen to know when uh, last week, I think, uh, is that, for example, he, 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 uh, he intervened uh, on the construction in Amboise, in Blois, of course. Uh, there is a, a, a Francis I wing in, in Blois, as you, uh, as you know. Uh, but those chateaux, Blois, Amboise, Le Louvre, uh, Fontainebleau, uh, were existing before. Uh, this is not the case with uh, Chambord. Uh, probably uh, in 1517, that is two years after his uh, crownment, 
uh, Francis I began to think about this new, uh, completely new uh, building. Francis I uh, is not only um, a king uh, of uh, art and letters, a king uh, of war, uh, is also, and uh, for me, it's of course the, 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 the central uh, issue, is an architect. And on this picture, for example, you see him uh, pictured as Saint Thomas. Uh, St. Thomas is the patron saint of architects, and uh, this picture uh, reveals that uh, Francis I uh, was really an architect. Actually, he, he drew himself uh, throughout his life uh, some, some sketches of buildings, and um, we know that he was uh, very uh, close to the, the, the construction uh, of the building of Chambord, the monument. That is, um, it was not like, okay, I, I, um, I sign a, a sort of a first uh, declaration stating that I want here a, a chateau to be built uh, exactly on the 6th of September, uh, 1519, what it did. And then I, I just, you know, uh, go away and uh, uh, think about something else. No, he was um, throughout the 20 years of the construction of the keep uh, between so uh, 19 and 39, uh, François uh, Ier came to Chambord to see himself uh, the evolution of the construction. And uh, he was uh, always very close to uh, uh, to the, um, the 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 evolution of the of the uh, of the construction, but what is amazing is that um, this chateau was not built as a chateau as uh, as a hunting lodge as uh, it was said for 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 years. It was also not a center for power. It was. It was too remote uh, from, from everything. Actually, Chambord was built in the middle of nowhere. So we had to make another hypothesis. That is that this chateau was uh, meant to um, perhaps to be a sort of ideal castle, uh, an ideal city. Um, and this is linked to different uh, influences. The first uh, uh, the first influence is the Christian influence. And first of all, it's um, from the uh, very famous book, the last book of the Bible, the Apocalypse uh, by uh, St. John. In the Apocalypse, uh, St. John said that uh, after uh, the end of the, of the times, right? After the end of the of the world, um, the uh, the the writers the writers will go to heaven, and uh, will stay next to the Father, in uh, a city that Saint John is actually describing, and this city is with twelve doors. Of course, the number 12 uh, is linked to uh, the 12 uh, apostles, the 12 tribes of Israel. So it's a sacred number. And on this um, wonderful manuscript of the 11th century, you see exactly what St. John is describing. That is a square in the center where uh, you have the figure of the, of the Christ and the 12 doors. It's exactly the, the plan that was um, meant to uh, be constructed in, in Chambord. Today, if you visit the, the chateau, you will not find those uh, 12 doors. But uh, actually, on the, the, uh, if I come back to the, to the map, you see that on this square, at the beginning, you had so a square as uh, uh, four sides, of course, and on each side you have three doors. So it means that you have altogether twelve doors, like in this um, in this manuscript. 
And if I go um, to this other manuscript, uh, it's uh, quite similar. There is a difference, quite similar, because there is this, uh, this square in the center, the 12 doors, but also those constructions, the, those towers that you, that you see. And um, actually, this is really linked to one of the source of uh, the architecture of Chambord. But there is also an, another one, another source. Um, this one is um, very clear here. In the center of this image, which is um, a wonderful painting on wood uh, from a Flemish uh, studio of the um, 15th century, uh, late 15th century, you see the Temple of Salomon. This is another Bible source. The Temple, temple of Salomon is, um, so to speak, a sort of sacred source of the, uh, the, uh, the Christian architecture. And this, uh, the, the, the Temple of Salomon, as you know, is in Jerusalem. And um, a few years after the apocalypse, um, exactly at the beginning of the fifth century, you have a very important uh, guy, St. Augustine, who uh, wrote namely this um, key book for uh, the church, which is uh, the City of God. In the City of God, um, St. Augustine uh, states that there are actually two Jerusalem, the earthly Jerusalem, and the heavenly Jerusalem. On this picture, you see uh, on the bottom, the, so to speak, real Jerusalem, that is the earthly Jerusalem. And of course, um, uh, on the, below, sorry, below there is a earthly Jerusalem. And on the top in the, in the heaven, you have God, as you, as you see. And this is a representation, one of the uh, numerous representations of the heavenly Jerusalem. What St. Augustine uh, wrote is that uh, hu the, the human being uh, have to uh, be um, as good as possible to build on earth a city, Jerusalem, which should be as good as possible to prepare themselves to go to transfer after death to uh, the uh, heavenly Jerusalem. So, so to speak, there is a sort of tension onto perfection on earth. The perfection is not possible to reach on earth, but it's a preparation of the perfection that you will uh, encounter uh, in, in heaven, in the uh, heavenly Jerusalem. So you see that um, those um, Christian sources are, uh, quite important uh, because the square, the 12 doors, the, the fact that there is an ideal possibility to build a construction on earth that could reflect the perfection of, of God, of heaven. Uh, this is uh, very important to understand the, the beginning, the concept of Chambord. But there is also another source just, uh, well, not just after, but during the Middle Age. And this source is the source of um, the, uh, what we call the, 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 the Brittany um, literature, that is uh, King Arthur legend. You have here um, a wonderful um, manuscript from the, uh, the end of the 15th century, so closer and closer to uh, uh, the, the, the beginning of the construction of, uh, of Chambord, um, where you can see um, the Knights of the Round Table with King Arthur. King Arthur is on the, on the left, but what is uh, striking here is that they are all, I mean, the knights and the king on the same level. There is this sort of equality uh, that is the king is not uh, above them, uh, but there is a sort of equal uh, stage where they uh, all sit together to uh, discuss uh, what the uh, what the realm of Arthur uh, should be. This is very important because uh, it seems that uh, this, um, if we combine uh, what I said about Apocalypse and Saint Augustine with uh, this equality of uh, King Arthur, and of course, uh, King Arthur was uh, an immediate reference 
for Francis I. It was just before uh, it came to the, uh, uh, to, the, to the kingdom. If you cross those two traditions, you come exactly at um, this period uh, of, uh, of this manuscript that is uh, end of the uh, or second part of the 15th century to um, what the Italians called the Citta Ideale, the ideal city. You have here a wonderful uh, view, Veduta, uh, which is in Urbino. I will come back a little afterwards uh, to this um, to this uh, uh, in, uh, in Italy. But um, in this representation, you see um, first some uh, figures, geometrical figures that we already encountered. The, the, the circle or the dome, uh, the square, the rectangle, and of course the perspective. This is a sort of ideal city as the Italians represented it at the end of the 15th century, that is one, two decades before Francis I began to think about Chambord. So this, the Christian um, influence, including uh, King Arthur, is one of the first uh, source that we can trace for Chambord. But there is, of course, another one, because we are in France, and of course, uh, the immediate reference for uh, the chateaus in France are the the big uh, fortresses of the of the Middle Age. I show you here a um, picture from the wonderful Trésor du Duc de Berry, uh, which is a, one of the most marvelous uh, manuscripts in, in in the world, uh, which is in the Chateau de Chantilly. Uh, and this is a representation of one of the major models for the fortress, uh, namely the Chateau du Louvre, because you probably know that uh, before being a museum, the Louvre was a royal uh, chateau. Um, you see the, the, the towers, the, the keep, very massive, very, uh, uh, very powerful. Of course, it's uh, those fortresses, and especially the Louvre, are uh, symbols of the, the power, uh, of the strength of the, of the kings. Another one, uh, which is also uh, um, uh, archetypal, uh, archi, um, architectural, uh, archetypic, sorry, uh, an example, a very good example, a model for, uh, for French fortresses, the Chateau de Saumur. Uh, you see that this is a model that is, that is not that far from the one of Le Louvre, but probably the, the, the most uh, important model for at that time was Le Chateau de Vincennes. You see here um, uh, the, the nine towers of Chateau de Vincennes, uh, and in the center, the uh, the big tower, a bit like in Chambord. It's here, it's more, more visible. And this is really um, the model of the French uh, fortresses uh, that are still um, really uh, the, the, the use, I would say, or the reference, the main reference at the end of the 15th century in France. Here you have the map of this chateau and you uh, can see very clearly the, uh, the nine different towers uh, plus the, the tower or the keep in the center. And so Chambord is also, of course, linked to this kind of, of source. But you saw uh, in the film, in the, in the model, in the picture, in the map I showed you of Chambord that uh, there are some, some, some big differences between uh, Chambord and Vincennes or Le Louvre. The reason there are so big differences is that there is a sort of cross uh, between the French source and the Italian source, or should I say sources. To begin to talk about Italy and the, the influence of Italy uh, on Chambord, on the conception of Chambord, I had to um, go back to uh, the second part of the Quattrocento, that is the second part of the 15th century, and evoke 
uh, a figure, uh, a character that uh, I didn't mention uh, up to now, it's uh, the architect himself. What is very uh, important to, um, to know, to understand, is that the, uh, the figure of the architect, the profession of architect, doesn't exist in France at the beginning of the 16th century. That is, when Francis I uh, imagined Chambord, the, 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 the concept of uh, someone being the architect, that is sort of a combination between an artist and a technician signing uh, a monument as we uh, are used to today uh, didn't exist in France. Actually, it was invented uh, in Italy uh, in the second part of the 15th century. And the, the first book, uh, so, so to speak, which creates the uh, figure of the architect is the book of uh, Alberti, De Re Idei Ficatoria. And after Alberti, you had two very important architects, uh, generally speaking, but also for us and for our, our subject today. Uh, the first one is uh, Pacioli, De Divina Proportionae. Uh, this book of um, 1509 uh, is very important for uh, some, uh, some uh, different reasons. The first uh, reason is that Pacioli was a friend of Leonardo. That's why in this book of uh, 1509, you see uh, this drawing, that there are several uh, drawings by Leonardo. And actually it's the first time a drawing of, uh, or by Leonardo was ever printed uh, in a book. Um, the second reason is that uh, Pacioli um, was, not only an architect, but also a mathematician, specialist of geometry. And uh, Leonardo spent two years with uh, Pacioli uh, to, um, to, 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 to go deeper in geometry under uh, the, the, the master Pacioli. Um, and you see, it's the third reason, that um, architecture has a lot to do with uh, geometrical forms uh, right from the beginning. Those forms are in this other manuscript from another big architect, uh, Giorgio Martini. Uh, these forms can be very, very close to Chambord. You see that very clearly, I think, on this, um, on this picture, circle, square, and a square in the center, uh, in the center of actually a Greek cross. I will come back to that a bit, uh, a bit later. Um, actually, what I also have to mention is that by the end of this uh, 15th century, where when those uh, manuscripts uh, were, uh, were, were written by uh, Pacioli or Giorgio Martini, uh, Leonardo, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, already had um, an experience in architecture. It was in Milano. Uh, he uh, first um, competed in a sort of uh, architecture contest for the Tiborio of the, uh, of the Milano Cathedral. And also he was very interested in urbanistic questions. Uh, because of the of the plague of the big plague in Milano at that time, and um, Leonardo um, drew uh, a lot of different sketches about uh, <coughs> movements and and flux. Uh, actually, his big uh, obsession was to divide the flux between people, uh, between also air and water, and this obsession. We will um, uh, we will meet uh, this obsession this obsession sorry a bit later because it's very important for um, our uh, our uh, issue today. You see here that <coughs> as I said, circles and squares are very important. And actually, if I come back to um, Pacioli, he wrote actually in uh, his treaty architecture treaty that the the core of architecture is the combination of circles and squares. But we have to add something. And the, the famous Homme de Vitruve uh, shows us what we have to add. You see here the square and the circle, but you also see a human body. And 
this is very important because at that time, uh, architecture said that, uh, or architects uh, like Alberti Pacioli or uh, Giorgio Martini, all of them said that architecture has to be linked on the body of, uh, of the human body. Because the human uh, the, uh, the man is a creator of God, so the proportion of men are uh, perfect because he was created by God. And so architecture has to stick on the proportion of the human body to, um, to, to draw, to sketch uh, buildings. So this uh, Homme de Vitruve, Vitruve being a Latin architect, um, is actually a sort of combination of the, 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 what, is, um, uh, what is useful, uh, what is necessary to think about architecture and then to create, uh, to create some, some buildings. Actually, this question of circle and squares were not only a question of architecture for uh, Leonardo, because he, was, um, he had this obsession to um, the squaring of the circle, uh, as you can see here on this um, other manuscript of Leonardo, uh, all those combinations of circles and, and, and squares. Uh, well, eventually he, he, he gave up uh, because it was impossible actually to, to, to find the squaring of the circle at, uh, by that time. But all of this um, goes to the Citta Ideale I just mentioned uh, a few minutes ago. I already showed you the, the one from Urbino, but there are three vedutta, uh, vedutte sorry, in, in the world. This from Urbino in Italy, this from Baltimore in the US, and this one from uh, which is now in, in Berlin. Um, what does it mean uh, to, to, to try to represent those um, ideal cities? Um, I already talked about the, 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 the fact that those images are uh, built uh, on the perspective combining uh, circles or domes and, and, and squares. Uh, the question of symmetry, of course. Um, but this actually uh, is um, a first try, very conceptual actually, to um, rethink the question of ideal city, that is of um, what I, uh, what St. Augustine uh, called uh, the earthly Jerusalem. And to understand that, we have to go to um, a last uh, treaty of architecture, the Treaty of uh, Filarete. This treaty is very interesting because um, it's actually a dialogue uh, between an architect and a prince um, about urbanism and about the fact that urbanism, uh, that is the good construction, is, um, is a way to build a good government. That is right from the beginning, Urbanism is linked to a, a political question. The, um, the ideal city, as the people from Renaissance uh, thought it, or thought about it, is an idealization of uh, circles and squares and towers in which um, the human being could be as good as possible and could perhaps try to approach this uh, ideal uh, city, this earthly Jerusalem, as um, St. Augustine uh, described it. And uh, they are also uh, linked at the beginning on this equality of uh, forms and position. Here on this uh, manuscript of Filaret, it's a page of his, um, not manuscript actually, of a printed book, uh, you see uh, the, the, what we already encountered a lot of time, uh, this square, you know, Greek cross, uh, square in the middle, and four towers on each angle, exactly as uh, the keep of Chambord. And on the right hand side, this uh, tower, uh, who uh, could, to a certain extent, uh, be compared with uh, the, uh, the, the big tower in the center of the chateau uh, even today. The, the question of circle, uh, of dome, is also very um, 
interesting because um, in this um, in this uh, in those drawings by uh, Philaret, you can see uh, when you have this drawing of uh, Leonardo uh, a few years before the beginning of construction of Chambord, you can see that there is a real connection between all those forms, those conceptual, those intellectual forms that uh, are, uh, in my opinion, uh, very linked to the uh, conception, to the first concept of Chambord. Uh, actually, by that time, uh, when Leonardo drew, uh, drew sorry, this uh, this drawing, he was um, he was um, linked with uh, Charles d'Amboise in uh, Milano, and uh, he was also um, a big. Uh, he, he was also uh, actually appointed to um, build uh, a house for uh, Charles d'Amboise, uh, which he didn't achieve uh, because Charles d'Amboise were uh, kicked out uh, from, from Milano. Um, but what is interesting is that in this house, we have uh, some, uh, a few sketches. He was uh, planning to use uh, domes, squares, but also Greek cross for the first time in the uh, civil architecture. And then I come back to this um, central plan uh, uh, in the shape of a Greek cross. This type of plan is not a civil plan. Actually, it, um, his, uh, the, the, the sources, the roots of this plan uh, has to be uh, found in Rome. What you see here is the Pantheon, and you see that the Pantheon is built on the Greek cross. It's a central plan in the shape of a Greek cross. So this means that it's an antique, uh, shape, and this means also that it is a sacred uh, shape, that is a shape that is used for uh, sacred uh, goals, here the Pantheon. What happened is that um, after uh, the, the, the fall of Rome, some intellectuals uh, escaped uh, the city of Rome and went to uh, Byzance, Byzantium, uh, where the uh, empire, the Roman Empire, uh, still went on. And so this kind of uh, sacred architecture based on the Greek cross moved to Byzantium. You have here uh, a map or plan of uh, Saint Sophia in Istanbul, that is Byzance, uh, which is also uh, built uh, on a Greek cross. And then after the, the Turks took uh, Byzantium uh, in uh, 1453, these intellectuals went back to Rome because they didn't want to leave, of course, under the uh, uh, the Muslim uh, policy of the of the Turks, and so it explains why, in the second part of the uh, Quattrocento, that is the second part of the 15th century in Italy, the Greek cross came back as the main shape for churches. It was not the case before. It was uh, before it, the 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 the, uh, the shape of uh, the, the traditional shape uh, for uh, churches in Italy and everywhere actually in Occident were was the Latin cross. But here you see that uh, St. Peter's uh, in Rome was built on uh, the Greek cross, was built actually by uh, and, and signed by an architect. This architect is Bramante, and Bramante was, um, was a friend of Leonardo. And actually, Leonardo da Vinci uh, saw the beginning of the construction of uh, St. Peter's Cathedral uh, Basil uh, yeah, Basil uh, in, in Rome, uh, beginning in uh, 1505. And then um, when you see, when you look at uh, a lot of manuscripts of uh, Leonardo da Vinci uh, at that time, that is by the end of the 15th century, beginning of the 17th century, of the 16th century, sorry, you see that um, he uh, realized a lot of uh, drawings of churches and they are all on this uh, shape, Greek cross, central plan, 
uh, as you can see here as well, uh, especially on the on the on the right page. As you can see also here, it's very clear on the on the right page. This uh, this uh, kind of uh, Greek cross um, uh, church. And um, that was a bit too far, sorry. <laughs> uh, but uh, Chambord is not a church. Whereas it will be built and uh, is still here today on uh, this uh, particular uh, Greek cross plan that was once again used uh, only for churches. So it means that um, there is, so to speak, a transfer of sacredness in the uh, architecture of Chambord, because it's now not a sacred monument anymore, which be, will be built on this uh, Greek cross, but a civil, a royal uh, monument. Another obsession of Leonardo is um, the spiral. You see it very clearly on the, on the, on the right side. Uh, the spiral, the ellipse, the oval, the vortex. Um, these are obsessions that uh, will lead to these wonderful drawings, the last drawings by Leonardo, where uh, you see uh, some, some vortex, some uh, sort of uh, catastrophes, uh, end of the world uh, with uh, vortex of, of water. But if you, you have so this this uh, this spiral on the on the on the right hand side, and you have on the left hand side uh, a staircase, you can perhaps read um, a bit uh, under the the staircase um, the the words in Italian. Uh, it's written as doble uh, doble del castillo. Uh, the double staircase of the castle. I don't uh, want to say that the uh, double staircase of Chambord is, uh, is a work of art uh, by Leonardo. It's impossible. Why? Because Leonardo died in uh, 1516 and, uh, uh, and the building of the construction of Chambord is three years later, um, 1519. But if you put together the, uh, the central plan, the Greek cross, um, you have, for example, this uh, drawing here, where you see clearly uh, the, uh, the shape of a castle uh, built in a Greek cross with four uh, towers on each angle. And this uh, drawing, is uh, from uh, from Leonardo. If you add to uh, to that uh, what I said about the um, the ellipse, the uh, ideal city, you are really not very far from uh, the original concept of the architecture of Chambord. But there is uh, one question left. It's the scale of this uh, Chateau de Chambord. The, the scale of Chambord is uh, really uh, huge. It's, as you know, uh, the biggest uh, Chateau de la Loire. It's actually the biggest chateau in France after Versailles. So it's uh, an enormous uh, monument for uh, that time, for the time of Renaissance. And uh, moreover, it's uh, an enormous monument, a sort of inhuman monument in the middle of nowhere. Chambord was really a no man's land when uh, the, the construction uh, began. And, and, and it was actually no man's, no man's land for uh, at least the, all the 16th century until uh, Louis XIV, Louis XIV, uh, came to, uh, to, 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 to pay visit to the, to, to the chateau and, and spend there uh, a few time. So actually it's, some it's a, a, a monument it's a construction which is too big to be inhabited actually it was not uh, uh habited uh throughout the throughout the centuries it was it was and it stayed 
uh, actually for five centuries uh, a desert place uh, called um, uh, not uh, uh, not very easy to live in. Uh, so why why uh, was it so big? Why did um, Francis the first um, order such um, uh, a, an incredible uh, construction or monument. It was said for a, for a long time that Chambord was uh, a place for hunting, was a sort of uh, hunting lodge. Actually, it's 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 true, but it's very uh, limited. Why? It's true because uh, yes, uh, Francis I, as all the kings of France, was very keen on hunting. Uh, it was a sort of uh, a royal uh, leisure or a pleasure to uh, uh, to hunt, uh, but you know after Chambord, uh, uh, Francis I built at least five different um, chateaux uh, in Ile de France, uh, which were really dedicated to uh, to hunting. Uh, La Muette, uh, the Chateau de Madrid, uh, Folombre. Uh, and so on. Um, but they were small, actually. And what is interesting is that the map that you have now in front of your eyes is dating from the 17th century. That is one century after uh, the construction of uh, the keep and of the royal wing of Chambord. This uh, map was drawn by an architect named Philippe Bien, uh, after some wooden models of the chateau that he found by chance in Blois. What you see here is very interesting. Why? Because first, this uh, chateau uh, is smaller than Chambord, really much smaller than Chambord than the keep, because it's the keep, uh, which was actually built uh, in, the seven, in the 16th century. That is, is uh, when he's uh, drawing this, uh, the, this plan, he, he knows that this plan doesn't uh, fit with uh, the actual building of Chambord, uh, which is uh, already constructed, right? So this is a big difference. The second big difference is the, um, the staircase. You see that here in the center, we, we have the Greek cross, but there is nothing in the center. There is not this wonderful uh, double helix uh, staircase. There is actually a staircase. There is this double ramped staircase that you see uh, in the in the bottom in the, in the south in the southern uh, rectangle. So this means that perhaps it's an hypothesis. Uh, it's not mine. It's um, a wonderful uh, hypothesis by um, an Italian uh, researcher, Mrs. Flaminia Bardatti, and Flaminia Bardatti said, "Okay, um, this was the original plan, but." At, at once, at, uh, during the, 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 uh, the conception, the intellectual conception of the chateau, they, that is Francis I, for sure, perhaps with Leonardo, they decided to put this enormous, wonderful, uh, never seen, double helix staircase in the center of the Greek cross. What does it mean? It means that they, to a certain extent, they, they followed the, the, the logic of the central plan up to the end. They, they completed this logic of uh, central plan by putting the, uh, the big uh, double staircase in the center and in the monument and not outside the monument. 
you saw in Blois, that's the, the, the wonderful uh, staircase in the Francis I wing is not in the monument, but outside the monument. You can see it right from the, from, from the beginning when you, you, you don't have to enter the chateau in Blois to see the staircase. You have to enter the chateau in Chambord to see it. From the outside, you don't see uh, the, this wonderful double helix staircase. So it means that I think uh, that the fact that they put this, um, this staircase in the center uh, changed radically the, uh, the idea of the monument. On this picture, you see in red the original hunting lodge, so to speak, that was uh, probably uh, meant for Chambord. You see that the double ramp uh, staircase in red is in the southern uh, wing or uh, uh, yeah, uh, wing of the, of, the, of the cross. And in, in black, you have the actual chateau with the double staircase helix in the center of the Greek cross. And you see that to put to, 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 to move this uh, staircase from a rectangle, the southern rectangle, to the center of the, of the building expands uh, dramatically the dimensions of the chateau. And my, uh, my thought, and it's not only my thought, uh, is that um, by putting the staircase in the middle, that is by completing the logic of the uh, central plan, um, it changed radically the idea of the construction. We are moving from a chateau to a sort of ideal city built um, in the middle of nowhere, inhabited because it's not meant to be a bit, it's not a house, so to speak. Uh, and then the staircase, it's is like the spine of uh, this um, wonderful monument, of this wonderful body. And um, this spine is probably also a sort of symbolic uh, construction of the dialogue between earth, that is the first floor, and heaven, you know, the terrace. So the, this spine, uh, which is the center in all the senses of the term of the building is a way uh, to um, implement the dialogue between uh, man and God. It's, so to speak, um, the try to, um, to, 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 to write, to, to uh, yeah, to write in the reality uh, through circles and square. Uh, also, it's a way to, it's a try to, to, to inscribe the, the movement in something that is, of course, uh, without any movement, that is a construction of, of, of stone. Well, after the big defeat of uh, Pavia, defeat of Francis I in uh, 1525, uh, probably uh, it was the end of this dream of ideal city, of uh, equality, and uh, after uh, Pavia, uh, actually uh, Francis I built uh, his wing, the royal wing. But still, uh, what is here, re visual reconstruction of the original plan, still this, this, um, this idea is still uh, uh, par partially completed today and was partially completed in uh, 1547 when the king died. Of course, um, you have here uh, the, 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 the state of the building at the, uh, by, the, uh, by the death of Francis I. You see that the, 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 the right wing, the royal wing, was uh, already built. Uh, the uh, left wing, the chapel wing, was not built uh, by that time. And, uh, but still, the keep in the center 
uh, was um, the, uh, the, the mark, the trace of uh, this uh, wonderful um, idea of uh, trying to build uh, on earth for this man of Renaissance, uh, the dream of the uh, earthly uh, Jerusalem by St. Augustine and uh, this dream of uh, an ideal city of the Citta Ideale that probably Leonardo da Vinci uh, brought uh, with him when he came to France three years before uh, the beginning of the construction of Chambord. Thank you very much. Russell, you're on mute. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Yannick, for that excellent explanation of the, the very many influences uh, that uh, ultimately led to the unique design and the huge scale of Chambord. We now know a lot more about those influences. We have a, a number of questions for you. You read me loud and clear? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so you referred to uh, at one time the, the roof, but the roof uh, has so many chimneys and slim towers and, and all. Would you would you describe what what does it represent? The roof of the donjon with all of its uh, dozens of chimneys and towers and turrets and so on. Is it a heavenly Jerusalem? Well <clears throat> Yeah, well, it's it's um, we can we can we can probably um, figure out that um, it's like a, a sort of um, of of a, of city. It's like a city, you know, like like different towers and different uh, um, different colors. Different. There are also some some circles, some triangles, some. Uh, and uh, what is stunning, actually, with uh, with the roof and the terrace in Chambord, is that um, there is a, a very strong divide between the the rest of the keep, uh, which is uh, without any decoration, and the and the the terrace, the roof. That is, it's it's a bit like you know, two, two chateaux uh, put together, but that wouldn't have uh, uh, a priori <laughs> anything to do together. You know, like, like the, the kids, for example, that sometimes the little kids, they have to combine some images and, uh, and sometimes it's a bit difficult for them to do that. And uh, Chambord is a bit <laughs> something like that. That is, you know, sort of keep very strong, very massive, very, uh, very middle-aged, I would say. Uh, I exaggerate a bit because you have some loggias that are really not middle-aged, but still uh, without any decoration or very few decorations and the, the sort of uh, madness of, of the roofs. And this is something that uh, is, is really stunning. And um, I think it represents also a sort of, um, of um, uh, energy of joy, of life, you know? Uh, and this is very... Um, this is very moving, actually. Yeah. Uh, Yannick, oh, perfect. OK. Uh, very good. Would you also, uh, there's, uh, we, we would like to hear a quote that uh, Chateaubriand, mm -hmm. what did he have to say? Can you uh, paraphrase or, or quote what did Chateaubriand have to say about Chambord? So he, he, yeah, when he, when he came to Chambord after that, he, he wrote, um, Les toits de Chambord so, sont comme la chevelure d'une femme soufflée par le vent. Mm. So now, Russell, you have to be the translator of Chateaubriand. Wow, that's beautiful. Uh, so the, the roof of Chambord is like the hair of a woman tousled by the wind. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, which is, a, is it symmetrical at all? I mean, there's so many. I can't tell whether the the towers balance each other out. Well. Almost everything in, Ch in Chambord is based is based, sorry, on a false symmetry. Mm. That is, you 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 got the impression when you arrive uh, that, for example, the two courtyards uh, are symmetrical. They are not. 
uh, even on the facade, mm -hmm. uh, have the impression that um, there are, for example, two loggias here and two here and two here. But if you look a bit uh, a bit closer, you you will see that it's not the case. And it's um, it's well, it's a bit like that in the roof. Whereas in the roof, there is a bit more symmetry actually than on the on the rest of the keep. Uh, the the different uh, little towers in the in the roof, their chimneys. Uh, there is more symmetry in uh, on the roofs, uh, whereas there is more a sort of jungle, you know, of uh, of towers, chimney, and, and whatever. Um, and this is also something that is very Chambord, I would say. That is, you have a keep which um, seems to be very uh, very pure, very uh, massive, very symmetrical, and the, this sort of uh, uh, madness of the roofs, uh, but in reality, if you look very, you know, carefully, you will see that there is much more symmetry in this so-called madness of the roofs than in the in the in the keep itself. Uh -huh. um, in the film, we saw the video at the very beginning. Uh, it featured, in addition to the chateau itself the gardens around the chateau. Were the gardens laid out uh, by Francois Premier or when were they laid out? No, um, the, the, first to, uh, uh, the first king to have an interest uh, uh, for the, the gardens uh, was Louis XIV. Hmm. And um, so there was a first, um, a first map and a first plan uh, by Le Nôtre. Oh. The well-known Le Nôtre, and uh, then, uh, but it was it was only a, the beginning of uh, construction because Louis the Fourteenth came a lot to Chambord uh, up to um, seventeen eighty-two, eighty-three, uh, and then uh, he moved to Versailles and, and Saint Germain uh, definitely, and didn't come back to uh, to Chambord. Um, but still, he, he came a lot, much more than Fran François Premier, actually. And uh, but the gardens were uh, really designed uh, in the 18th century, uh -huh. 1734 for the first plant and 1743 for the second one. And uh, we uh, reconstructed those gardens um, three years ago. Uh, respecting those uh, those plants of the uh, 18th century. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, apart from seeing the magnificent double helix staircase, um, which, uh, and again, looking at the very beginning of the, the, the video, that didn't show much in the way of interior uh, decorations. And so could you, uh, could you explain, first of all, was the chateau ever furnished? And if, if you visit today, what does the interior uh, look like? Because there, I read somewhere that there are 440 rooms. Uh, are, are many of them open to the public? And uh, what are in them? No, because, um, uh, because the, well, first, to, perhaps I will uh, begin to answer your, your first question. The, the, um, the chateau was empty uh, for, uh, at, at least uh, until until Louis XIV, hmm. and it was the, it was the case for almost every uh, royal chateau in Renaissance because the the, the court uh, wasn't fixed at that time, as you know. Actually, the the court uh, will be fixed by Louis XIV in Versailles. Right. Before Versailles, Louis XIV is, uh, is still, you know, moving from uh, Chateau to the other. Uh, so he spends much more time than uh, the, the, the kings uh, before him, but, uh, but still. So, uh, for example, when, when François Ier come, uh, comes to Chambord, uh, he comes perhaps sometimes for three days, for one week, you know. So the, the Chateau is, is empty. And as soon as uh, you know that the... the the king will come, they, they furnish it. Yeah. That's why the, uh, the, the French word for uh, furniture is mobilier, and mobilier, it comes from mobile. Ah. Very small, that is, you know, they, ha they have uh, furniture that are 
uh, put in Chambord when the king will come and he is there. And then the king, you know, de de departs from Chambord, everything is removed, you know. And so the furniture, uh, that's also why the furniture of the Renaissance uh, are not so numerous. Um, most of them are not very precious, you know. It has to be, um, it's like, <laughs> It's like a sort of IKEA style, you know, but uh, back from you know, <laughs> back in the 16th, because you know, for example, your bed or you, you it has to be uh, fold, you know, and mm -hmm. it's fold very quickly, and then fold again to go to go back to whatever, you know. Um, but after that, with uh, Louis the Fourteenth, uh, the chateau of of course Louis uh, Louis XIV, Louis the Fourteenth will uh, bring some some furniture that will stay in the chateau. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, some of them are here today, and some of them were uh, purchased afterwards, you know, by um, uh, by other kings or by the state, the republic, when uh, Chambord became uh, the property of the of the French Republic in uh, uh, 1930, and uh, and then in the 18th century um, there will be. Um, not a lot, but three different landlords, so to speak, or inhabitants of the chateau. Um, Lezinski, the king of Poland in exile, uh, who was actually the, the father of the queen of France. So the stepfather of Louis XV, right? So he spent a few years in Chambord, so of course it was furnished. And then uh, Le Maréchal de Saxe, who was uh, a big, uh, a big general, marshal actually, marshal uh, of Louis the Fifteenth. Uh, he namely was the uh, the guy who uh, who uh, defeated the British uh, army in Fontenoy, and so he spent the five last years of his life in Chambord. He died in Chambord, and uh, which is important for us because we know uh, because by his death there was an inventory of the furniture. So we know exactly what was there at, by that time. And some of the furniture are still on display today. So um, it means that when you come to Chambord, the first floor is uh, is fully furnished, uh, 17th, 18th century, and a bit of 19th as well. First floor is uh, much more 19th century. And the, the second floor is, uh, is empty because it's the, the, the floor of the 16th century, so to speak. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's also a way to show the architecture uh, as nude as it has to be to understand and to uh, and to enjoy the the, the, the architecture of the um, of the building. Okay, thank you so much for that explanation. Uh, I read somewhere that uh, when when Francois Premier, how many times how much time did Francois Premier spend at Chambord during 70, his reign? Seventy three days. Seventy three days. And you said typically for three days or a week at a time? Yeah, because, and also, of course, he didn't spend so much time in Chambord, uh, also because the, the chateau was under construction. Hmm. Sure. So, you know, he, he, um, when he came to, to the place Chambord, the, the, in the first decade, for example, uh, he didn't stay in Chambord because you couldn't sleep in the yeah. chateau, you know? So he, he, he used another a little chateau or manoir in the, in the area, in the, in the estate. Uh, but yes, it's, it's true that uh, by that time, um, well, and I, I also mentioned in, in, my, in my talk that uh, Chambord uh, wasn't meant and never was a, sen a center for power because it was too remote from everything. So, mm -hmm. of course, it's a royal chateau because it was built and, and you know, fought and, and, uh, by, 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 by a king, by Francis I, but uh, it was not a chateau uh, from where you could, uh, you could show your power or, uh, you know, uh, really rule the, the country. Mm, right. It, that's, that's why um, I, I think, and we, we, uh, we are some to, to think that the, the, the chateau was not, um, was not built for that, you know, which is a big difference with uh, the vast majority of, uh, of, the, sh of the royal uh, 
chateaux in France, mm -hmm. uh, which were meant to be centers for power. One last question. <clears throat> um, how many visitors in an, an average year would visit uh, the Chateau de Chambord? So in a normal year, uh, which is not the case right now, uh, it's uh, over uh, 1 million. Wow. That must be one of the highest uh, number of visitors visiting any chateau in France. Yeah, after Versailles, of course, uh, it's the, the most visited chateau in France. Awesome, I did not know that, okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Yannick, for your very erudite presentation uh, of the design of this uh, huge and impressive Chateau de Chambord. Uh, we've learned a lot from it. Uh, and I dare say that many of us are inspired to visit Ch uh, Chambord when you open, hopefully very soon. We, we all hope. And I should tell everybody in the uh, audience that they will be receiving not only a video of today's lecture in the next day or two, but also a wonderful eight minute video that uh, the Chateau produced two years ago uh, on the occasion of the 500th anniversary of the beginning of the construction of Chambord, uh, which really sh uh, shows how the ch ch un it deconstructs the Chateau. And it's, it's largely computer generated, but it's a perfect complement uh, to Yannick's presentation because it, it will confirm the theories that he set out uh, today. And you will receive two versions of the video, one in French uh, and one with English subtitles. Unfortunately, the one with English subtitles doesn't have any music with it, but uh, it's a great, uh, compensation, you can watch both of them. Um, I would like to first and foremost thank Yannick for his presentation. Thank you. And also to thank our co-host, the Federation uh, of Alliance Francaise USA, the uh, French Heritage Society and Weiss in Paris. And to all of you out there in the audience for participating today. And I urge you to please tune in next Thursday, same time, same place, for a tour of the historic Chateau de Chenonceau, not too far from Chambord, but a very, very different chateau, certainly in scales, certainly in the way it evolved over history, uh, also known as the Chateau des Dames, or the Ladies Chateau. Presentation will be given by its uh, fifth generation owner, Henri Meunier, also in English, as well all the remaining uh, lectures in the Chateau series. So I would ask all of you to please uh, unmute yourselves and join me in giving Yannick uh, a, a big round of applause for his presentation.